there's a huge political amount of capital in the telling of history. Um, Alan Munslow said that history is never innocent storytelling. It's a primary vehicle through which power is distributed and used. And so the whole notion of political identity and ideology and um, who the United States is as a nation plays into how the story um, how the story is told and who has gotten to tell the story. And so the idea of letting Indian people tell that story themselves, I think is uh, powerful and progressive. Allow us to give the history of our people the way we want it to be told, not the way it was written in the books, not the way it was portrayed in newspapers of the past, magazines and all the other media that we needed to be able to show the people who we really were, are, what we are going to be tomorrow. Nobody can tell our story like we can. We have a lot of um, oral traditions and oral history that has come down that, has, that hasn't been written anywhere. Um, and a part of that is our values. Indian people have never had voices in interpretation of the expansion of the Northwest, simply because they ne we were never considered experts. There's a lot of myths, there's misunderstandings, uh, misconceptions about Indian people. We need to clarify what we are and who we are in our terms. If we go back to the people of non-Indian descent and ask them how they eventually came to our country. They have many hidden stories that they don't want to talk about because you read the history books, Washington State History, Montana State History, you will see a glorious account of what had occurred which actually didn't occur. So I can understand some of the animosity of the non-Native American people when it comes to this point. So when Lewis and Clark Bicentennial came to the Yakima Nation, we said it should be a time of healing on both sides, the non-Indians as well as the Indians, so that we may be able to better understand the sufferings of both sides. To a lot of people in America, it's really disconcerting to look at American history in a very different way. And I know that it's unsettling because we like to believe that people are good. We want to believe that our leaders are good. We want to believe that their intentions are good and we want to feel good about that. But we can't always look at history and feel good. But I think it's really important for America to become honest about that. We need to rethink how we relate to other people and how we treat other people. Um, and being honest, and being honest about that and telling our story. I think that's important for America to come of age in that way. And so I think that this is one way that we can start to do that, by telling the truth about how this country evolved, about how this country came to be, and who paid the cost. When I contrast the 10,000 year history of the Wasco people with the 230 some odd years in the United States, it's really difficult to get the concept across of how the history defines who I am. What my history reflects is a continuity of a language, a continuity of a culture. And it's really difficult 
to try to get this concept across to someone from a culture that's so young. All the older people, what they always have said is we've been here since the beginning of time, since the first daylight. There is no migration story. We were created here. We did not cross any land bridge. We have our creation story here. It would take me three days to tell you that story. But we were created here. We've always been here. Our traditions and our language specifically uh, has not changed. We have songs. We have customs that are handed down generation to generation. And because of that, we've been able to maintain a way of life that has been carried for thousands of years. And when we can go back and say this spot and this spot and this area was used at this time by these people, that's what continues for us a way to keep our past a part of our everyday life. You know how oral history was really done. Uh, years ago, they, what they would do, if there were several of them that experienced the same thing, same whatever happened, a fight or whatever, they would all sit down and each person would tell their version of what happened. And then the next person would do the same thing and they'd go clear around and then all of them would, would put it together the way they thought it, it actually happened. And that was oral history. We traveled this cold continent and we called it an island. We called the United States, you know, the, the northern and western hemisphere here, an island. Well, how did we know that? How did we know there was water all the way around? Because we went there. Very simple. Very simple and direct. That's why we call this continent an island. Because there's water to the south, there's water to the west, there's water to the east, and there's a great lake to the north of us. We spoke of a country that was hot all year long. Well, how did we know that? We must have been there. And we, we speak of these traveling stories, just little bits and pieces of information that tells me quite a bit. A Nespers went so far south, he's seen an animal he'd never seen before. And he called it Pitzkoyet, which means imitator, which is the monkey. You know, so those little bits and pieces of information carry a lot of significance there were always individuals who went outside of the Aboriginal territory. For example, there was knowledge in the stories of the east coast of the ocean on, on both coasts. In fact, one of the traders that came through uh, right around 1800 and right before then, one of the Kootenai women helped guide them out to the west coast. So it was um, so that they were aware of of the entire continent. I know from reviewing some of the maps of years ago of uh, what Lewis and Clark and all of them studied before their uh, westward journey, and there's nothing but a bare space. And that's how many people perceived the country, as a bare space, and it was not at all. It was uh, tribes, they were going to and from commerce, you had trader tribes and things of this nature. And that's just how they got along, you had to get along that way. It was common, especially for the men who did the trading, to know more than one language. Um, both my grandparents on my dad's dad's side and my dad's mother's side spoke at least uh, five languages plus. And uh, there's one, two major passes into the Buffalo country. So the Hussein and Isq, and that's a canal called Lolo Trail. Another one was the Southern Nespers route. So that went on to another lifestyle of the buffalo hunting people. And also, too, you go west from there, you go to the Columbia River country. The Columbia River was also the uh, equivalent of a freeway. People traveled up and down the river, not only to visit, but that was one of our main activities was the commerce, the trading. So 
the people upriver, the tributaries, would come down to roughly the Dalles area. Uh, Nicloide was one of the main trading areas, Salilo and Nicloide. So that area was very important to our lifestyle. And all of our legends were based on the geography of that area. And the geography was really interesting because it was all basalt. So we had all these basalt cliffs. And then we also had lava along the Columbia River. And this is before the dams were built. You could, you could see the texture of the lava. So we had stories relating to the texture of these lavas. And we had stories relating to the different valleys through the basalt cliffs. If you compared our place names with, a, say, a state map, the amount of names that we have for our area is immense. I mean, every little creek that's n too small to be on maybe someone else's map, we have a name for it. So our histories that we have about our past have a lot to do with the environment and nature's elements, whether they be water, snow, rain, even heat, droughts, those are the indicators that we use within our oral histories to help gauge us with the time. people were, were pretty happy when they first run on to the white man because they, they thought he'd come from the light. But even before that, I used to hear some of the old people say when, when the Columbus landed on the coast, see the universal language was sign language. So when, when they first landed, the communication was pretty fast. Pretty soon they found out that, that somebody had, had landed on the shores of, of this great country. And they used to say when he first landed, the Indians laid out beaver pelts and bear hides and buffalo robes and whatever they, whatever they valued for him to walk on because they thought he was something special. Trade is very, very important to the people. You know, again, to gain different things, uh, the coming of the horse, the, the metal from the, the rifles and things of this nature. And I know some of the history books state that the Nespers received the horses in 1720, 1730, and I, I dispute that. I believe the Nespers got it maybe 16, 1680s, maybe, even 1690. Consider the Spanish that came up there with the horses among the Pueblos, and the Navajos and the Apaches and the Camaches, it's just like a brand new weapon on the block. It's like even today's thing, everybody wants nuclear weapons. And then, uh, back in those days, boy, word must have spread so fast about this new creature, it makes life so easy. The Shoshones came with ponies and then the Cayuses got a couple of those ponies and they started uh, breeding Cayuse ponies. They were small and they were really fast. And so it was just what they needed, uh, a, a small, fast horse. So they just kept breeding Cayuses. And they, were, they had uh, thousands of Cayuse horses at one time. When we got horses, it opened up for us to, to go. That's when they, they can go buffalo hunting. They can go all different places, go visit their neighboring tribes, you know, to the, 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 that was accommodating. In most cases, our enemy was the Black Feet. They had guns, and we didn't have any, and we began trading for guns, that's what we wanted. Prior to 
David Thompson arriving in 1800, there was, the Blackfeet had first traded with Thompson and first traded with the traders, and so they had guns. The Kootenays just had bows. And so they, they knew the value of the guns because it had been introduced, but they didn't have a lot of them. And so it was kind of a, um, a pretty uneven match, you know, with uh, trying to war with the Blackfeet who were invading the territory and they had guns. And people have a misconception that we always lived on this side of the mountains, but that's incorrect. And that decision for all of the bands to move on this side of the mountains was really due to um, several factors, you know, horses, of course, increasing mobility and the likelihood of people um, encountering other tribes, some of whom might be hostile, the co competition for resource in our hunting ground and the acquisition of firearms by um, enemy tribes before us. And the traders, you know, were held hostage by the Blackfeet in particular and threatened, you know, that they'd be skinned alive, I think in one journal I read, if they gave guns to the Salish. You know, not only will we kill you, but it won't be a pleasant death, you know. And so that military power imbalance that happened, you know, if you think of a contempt, you know, a modern gun back then, you know, versus uh, a bow and arrow or a war club. Um, it had a huge impact on a tribe that had already been decimated by smallpox. I think people have said at least a third of our community of the, or of the Salish tribe were lost to smallpox. There were two big epidemics. The diseases hit before the ships came into Straits of Juan de Fuca, around 1790. Already villages were ravaged because of Vancouver. And so it, it came through like Nisqually, through the interior that way, because there was trading clear down to Nisqually. The tribes, they traveled far in their trading. And so they already knew that another culture and other people were coming, coming west. In the 1780s, there was great, great famine. There was great diseases that came down the Columbia River. Our people died from fever and, and, and scars upon their face, wasn't able to eat, wasn't able to drink water. We couldn't cool their bodies down, and villages totally disappeared along the Columbia River. And all the trade came up the Missouri. So when the smallpox epidemic started to wipe people out down the Missouri, the trade among Indian tribes brought it up long before the white people ever arrived. And so there were epidemics before, before they came along. When Lewis and Clark come along and they speak uh, in their journals about deserted villages, you know, they weren't deserted. They had been wiped out by the smallpox that had preceded them. When you think about our culture when it's like 10,000 years old, I think there probably was a stability for literally thousands of years, a stability in the language, a stability in how we fished and processed our food. And the real change, upheaval, came in probably the 1800s with the meeting of Europeans along the coast and then the meeting of Americans from the east. And suddenly there was this tremendous change. I mean, it was just an accelerated change. When we first saw the new people that came to our area, we called them babatlid, and it comes from the word house, ba'as. It, it, babatlid means a house on the water, because we had canoes, many different sizes of canoes and types of canoes, but these people lived on their house on the water. So in our oral traditions, uh, we've had several different people groups come by here. We had a shipwreck from a 
a group of Russians and that was one of the early contacts in the 1800s and then another later in the 1830s a Japanese shipwreck that came through here but I'd say even earlier than that probably maybe one of the earlier contacts would have been the Spanish because they came here in the 1790s and they actually built a fort here in the bay. We had five villages and one of the villages that the people used to take down the longhouse boards and transport them in between two canoes and move a whole residence to an, a fishing camp to be closer either to the halibut banks or whaling grounds and so they would move to the, another village for that season to a seasonal village and so when the Spanish came here it looked like an abandoned village in a way because a lot of the longhouse planks were removed and they just moved in because it was a good location of course where our where our permanent village was located and so that was one of the first encounters they you know more or less moved in to our space. Manuel Quimper in 1790 stopped at Freshwater Bay and canoes came out to greet him and brought fresh berries and, and salmon. And, uh, and then Captain Vancouver also stopped at uh, the village at Discovery Bay. But when he stopped and men were sent ashore, people had died and they could tell it was from the diseases. Indian people from the beginning of invasion were gracious, were humane, were hospitable, were generous. What elders and ancestors said about meeting, you know, these white men coming through with this large entourage of people. And it was very curious to me, but it was also familiar to me how Indian people are and how they treat other people and I guess the capacity for their generosity and humanity almost to a fault and to their detriment and sometimes to their genocide and it's a common story it's a common story that doesn't get told in US history because it was the Indian people that they interacted with it was the Indian people that they got um, food and and horses as transportation there was groups that showed them how to make canoes, how to navigate the rivers, what country was, was more fierce than the next, and they showed them how to survive out here because they didn't have any idea. And that's what we want people to know is that the Indians played a very big part in the Lewis and Clark expedition. Celia Ost, my great-great-grandmother, was born in 1801 and was four years old when Lewis and Clark arrived in 1805. Her father, Kamawul, or Gobaway, as our family called him, was the neighbor to the fort, the one that Lewis and Clark looked to for trade, for support. And uh, they had a very important relationship. They arrived at the wrong time of year. They were in a hard place. We supported, traded with them, and treated them as neighbors, sometimes friendly neighbors, sometimes not so friendly neighbors. Our people found Lewis and Clark to be uh, kind of a pathetic motley group. They were, um, didn't have much food. Their, their clothes were just about rotting right off of them. Um, they didn't have a lot to trade. We had been used to trading with ships that had been coming into the mouth of the Columbia River and uh, we're used to pretty expensive goods. To, um, and Lewis and Clark really didn't have a lot to offer by the time they got to us. Lewis and Clark saw how the Native people ate and dressed, but um, they stuck to what they knew. They were, to me, they were, they were very much like um, arrogant American tourists. <laughs> they only spoke their own language they um, would not try different food. They were used to eating meat, but if they ate the way the Chinook people ate, they would have gotten all the minerals their body needed from sea vegetables and from the salmon. And this sort of surprised me because they had 
uh, French voyageurs traveling with them, and the French um, in the, say, the Missouri area, they adopted a lot of the native ways. Um, they learned the languages. They even married, intermarried with the people. But uh, Lewis and Clark were a different breed. They describe us as, as uh, inquisitive and that we pilfered a lot. And uh, I think we found them to be um, conniving. When you read the journals, they refer to us as savages. Throughout the journals, we're savages. And since they think of us as savages and not human, um, they could walk into our dwellings just like they could walk into a bear's den or some animal's den. And you know, it never dawned on them that, that we're humans and we had our um, way of doing things as a community. They were talking to and about people that have had a continuous presence in this place for millennia. And it hasn't changed that much. We're connected to that point in time, not by years and dates and facts and figures in their journals, although their journals remind us of things. But we have a cultural continuity here on this river that we share that people should understand has been going on for a lot longer than when they wrote it down. The stick games that they try to describe and the bone game they try to describe, those have been a, a method of redistributing wealth for a long time. Um, and to our way of thinking, gaming still, we're still using gaming to redistribute wealth. The continuity of the Thule mats, the bull rush, the Thule's are still here. The animals, most of them are still here. There are some that have been decimated. The sage grouse, some species of salmon, the time that they came through, the reasonable estimates are probably between 16 and 20 million fish came up that river home to our tributaries and drainage systems. And now a million to five million um, people think is a lot. Uh, abundance was a different measurement then. Uh, our well-being was measured differently then. We had met Lewis and Clark. We met them on the river south of us. Clark wrote in his journals when they met with the Skitsu people, what our people say that they were told, we have heard about you. We have heard about how you have come across and met all these other tribes saying you are their friend, but yet your men do some terrible things. So you will not meet the Coeur d'Alene's. We will not let you. Yeah, we met Lewis and Clark, but their reputation preceded them with our chiefs. The immediate impact of the success of the Lewis and Clark expedition, being able to go do this huge transcontinental trip, talk about all the wealth and resource along the way, and be able to return, and then the explosion of the fur trade. Hudson Bay Company made contact with us, some of, some of their trappers, their early trappers. It wasn't until 1809 that the Northwest Fur Company established themselves on what was called Indian Meadows, our campground. And they also gave us Pointed Heart, the name Pointed Heart. When they established their fur trading house, the first customers that came in were Pointed Hearts. Sixteen canoes full of furs and pelts arrived to trade and traded thereafter for about a year and a half. And then the Salish House was opened up on what is now called Thompson Falls and we would trade there, go that far.
few years later, the Northwest Fur Company opened up with the cooperation of the Pointed Hearts to show them the way down to the Spokane Falls to meet with the Spokane Indian people. And there the Spokane House was established around 18 and 30 we were hit with smallpox. At that time, it was estimated by the fur company, Northwest Fur Company, that there was 5,000 Coeur d'Alene's in that area. We were hit with smallpox, devastated the people. People that were coming in in the uh, 1830s, they saw just bodies, literally piles of bodies of, of dead Indians. The uh, American Indians didn't uh, have the um, uh, resistances to uh, the, the uh, European diseases because uh, it, it wasn't a part of their, their living history. The first big fur trading post uh, that the Clallams had contact with was down at Fort Nisqually and then later there was a fort at Victoria, and that had a huge impact right across from where we're located. It was during that time with the fur trading that there was just a lot of lawlessness, you know, and that Wild West, you know, image, not only with interactions between whites and Indians, but between tribes. And it was because of the way the economy was changing. People were hunting, you know, to sell the, you know, furs. Villages were, were disappearing either by disease or because of the war. Like the, actually the village of Chimicum, there was a, such a small population from diseases and all the changes going on that uh, there was one war against them, two tribes attacking Chimicum and, and they became extinct. Back in 1852 or 53, we had a trader that was here, his name was Samuel Hancock, and he had a trading post. And so at that time in his journal, he documents how many hundreds and hundreds of people died that he, he was an eyewitness to, and how, how many weeks that that epidemic went on and on. And then several years later, there was another epidemic, but on our southern side at the village of Ozette, there was a ship that went by later, I think in 1859, it was called the Good Cheer, and they had an epidemic of smallpox aboard that ship, and it was due to the people on the Good Cheer throwing items overboard, and some of those clothes and blankets had, had the disease on it. And I think they were just trying to get rid of the disease. There was introduction of alcohol, which had never been here before fur trading, and that had a huge impact on communities. And then you see this huge, huge uh, impact on animal communities. You know that by 1830, I was reading uh, traders report that the beaver were gone from Rocky Mountain streams. It was shocking. It was shocking to me um, when I think about how um, ancestors said how just the abundance and it's hard for us to imagine that I can't really imagine it what kind of abundance there was but how in a very short period of time you know whole animal populations and regions were just at, completely gone before they didn't hunt to to sell and so some of the animals became extinct in our area. Once the, they realized that the sea otter fur from our area was really valued by the Chinese, they could trade and get furs here and then hike up the price by quite a huge margin. As the demand for it became more, we, I think we tried to meet the demand, but, you know, eventually the sea otter became overhunted. Those men were working for the Hudson Bay trade uh, and they traveled then from here down to San Francisco 
and back. And that's the days when the, uh, the native oysters were uh, harvested and transported down uh, by little sailing ships that came into the bay here. There was no women here except the young Indian women. And so when they came along, you see, they, they, they tied in together with the young Indian girls, you know. And so that's what happened to my grandmother and my great-grandmother. My father was born of a union from the Hudson Bay Company. Um, those trappers, fur trappers that came down with the Hudson Bay Company, some of them married into the Indian tribes, the tribal women. People that were born of these unions were called breeds or half-breeds. They weren't very well accepted either by the non-Indian community or the Indian community. It was just the conflict you know, a conflict of cultures. They didn't understand one another. It's the Indian custom that the land provides everything that they had. Well, they seen Whitman put these little seeds in the ground and then pretty soon these foods start coming up, watermelons, peas, corn, potatoes. And one time, a couple of the young um, Indians at the mission site wanted to see what the watermelons tasted like. And Whitman did do things for protecting his property just like putting um, the arsenic in the watermelons. And then also Whitman, he had cattle, he had sheep at the mission. What he did was he poisoned some meat to get the wolves and the coyotes to get that instead of the good stuff. And um, it just so happened that one time the Indians seen this meat hanging up. And so then he, here they got a hold of it and they got sick. The Whitmans were killed on November 29, 1847. Their mission was only in existence for 11 years before all of this came to a head. In the 1840s, the missionary arrived. The Jesuit. He was foretold the coming of this man by a chief named Circling Raven in the late 1700s. He told the Indian people, the Stichumsh people, that there would be a man coming in a black robe carrying a cross stick and that he would bring us words that would give us two trails to the heavens. Our original way with our Tupias, our old people, and this additional way. This man arrived on Rathrum Prairie with some flathead Indian people one day, and he was taken to the big camps. And there he established himself because two reasons. Number one, Circle and Raven told of his coming. And number two, in order for him to stay, he promised guns to the Coeur d'Alene's. And we were battling then and protecting our area with the encroachers of the blood, the pigan, and the black feet. The priests, when they first came into this area, was in about 1842, which is long before the establishment of our reservation. The people at that time wanted to wanted us to become farmers and be, uh, <laughs> I I call us the un, the Kalispell people or the Pondere people as one of the uncivilized tribes because we never were meant to be farmers, I don't think, you know, and we were put in this place and the growing season was short and the winters very severe. The Kalispell Ponderay people adapted themselves pretty well to Catholicism and they followed and I don't, I don't mean to be disrespectful to the Catholic Church, but when someone comes in and tells you that you're going to spend the rest of your time in hell, and if you don't do this and if you don't do that, and when they were doing that is when they wanted to move the St. Ignatius Mission, the very first St. Ignatius Mission, 
it was established here on the Kalispell. The church was moved to which is now St. Ignatius, Montana. And I know that at one point or another when they were wanting to move, they wanted all the Indian people to move with it. And to me, that sounds a little fishy. I think it was really hard for Plateau people to learn uh, farming when the missionaries first came in, both down here at Stevensville and over at Lapway because the Plateau people, only women could put their hands in the earth. Men couldn't put their hands in the earth and, and farm. We couldn't even dig roots because men had blood on their hands, because we're hunters and warriors, takers of life. But the women are givers of life, and they're pure. And so they can put their hands in the earth. and that's a concept that was really hard for Plateau people to come to grips with because it had been so ingrained for thousands of years that men don't do that. Uh, first white settlers that came out thought, oh, these guys are really lazy. They're really lazy. The women are out there digging those roots and bending over and working hard all the time, but they didn't realize the cultural implication of a man putting his hands in the, into the earth. Many of the Coeur d'Alene's, mostly in that southern group, became excellent farmers. They accepted this change immediately. They embraced the Jesuit and his words. And there were those who refused. And those who refused were punished by the missionary. It was like the missionary did not want us to have two ways to the heavens. It was, this one is no good. This one is the only one. One of the oral histories about the first missionaries, one of the first stories that was told and translated here was about Noah and the flood and, and how it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. And if you live in Nia Bay, it can do that in the winter, 40 days and 40 nights, and, and then some. So I think hearing that story for our first one was, they didn't find it uh, out of the ordinary. The first uh, of the treaties, they were called the Anson Dart Treaties, and uh, there was a whole series of them uh, written with the different tribes. It provided uh, the, the signers, the uh, Clatsops, the uh, Anahalans, and also the Tilmuks in general, they can select a certain site for hunting and fishing. That treaty was not fulfilled. Uh, the uh, chiefs and headmen of the, the tribe signing uh, felt that they had a, a deal with the United States government and the United States government would honor their uh, rights and, and uh, at the same time uh, the people the immigrants that wanted to come in and take over the land would, would be given the land. We had a treaty that was called the Tansy Point Treaty, where the Clatsop, the Chinooks, um, all the different tribes of the Chinook nation signed treaties at Tansy Point, ceding our territory. Defined in those treaties were little reservations in what is now Clatsop County, Pacific County. and. The non-Indians moved in, they started farming, fishing, cutting down the timber. But that document, which was signed by us, went to Washington and was never signed by the president, was never ratified by Congress. That document that we thought 
was going to uh, be the terms of agreement and was going to be our future turned out to be worthless. We ended up um, being lost in our own, in our own country. Uh, many of us had to move away from there. We were pushed out. There's a man by the name of Governor Isaac I. Stevens who was sent over here by the great white father here to make treaties with the, with the tribes, knowing that there's going to be a railroad that's going to be put through the area. And so he wanted the tribes put in certain areas. In 1855, uh, Governor Stevens was uh, traveling around western Washington with a uh, team uh, to uh, have these treaties signed. And so he would try to gather uh, multiple tribes together to sign under one treaty and was successful. First was Medicine Creek and then the second one was Point No Point and they met over by the Port Gamble area. And there they brought together the Skokomish, the Clallams, and the, the uh, Chimicum. They're all separate, different tribes. And they were successful in signing the treaty around January 26th. So it was during the winter. And uh, they brought all the sub-chiefs together and, and they appointed one main chief from the uh, Port Townsend, uh, Clallam village of Katai. His name was Chetsamoka. Governor Stevens met with the uh, tribal chiefs and explained each article of the treaty one by one with an interpreter and they also used the Chinook jargon and that night they talked amongst themselves about it and uh, at first they did not want they did not want to sign and and many of the sub chiefs spoke out to say that they wanted to make sure they had their fishing and hunting grounds because they moved they moved around to fish and hunt. They didn't stay in one place and gathering. And so that was very important that that was an article. Then uh, that night, uh, the village was bombed. There was a ship out in the harbor and, the, uh, and a lot of people were killed. That bombing had to do with threatening, you know, the chiefs to sign the treaty for one, but it also had to do with some other incident that happened before, like a retaliation. So the next morning when they were to meet with Governor Stevens again, uh, the sub-chiefs came with white flags and gave up and signed. One of the stipulations was that all the Clallams, Chimicum, would go to live on the Skokomish reservation. And there was there was one attempt at moving a village, and it was a village at Port Townsend, Cut Tai. They gathered up all the people that lived there in their canoes and tied them behind a steamboat, canoe to canoe, you know, so it was a long chain, all their belongings that they could gather in the time they had. And then they saw their houses, their village being burned as they were leaving. When they came, our population was so depleted compared to what it was. Just two to three years prior to the signing of the treaty, one village was completely wiped out by smallpox other than a mother and a son that were left behind. And being outgunned and outmanned and everything. Uh, and also the, I would say the Indian grapevine or the, the way that native people travel about and hear what's going on in the world. There was a big network like that and so our people were expecting the treaty party is what I was told and that when they came um, they set up a, a meeting and our some of the head people that were here went out by canoe to the, their schooner and they had a discussion the night before the treaty signing and they wanted to have other tribes come to Nia Bay and also our village of Ozette, which was furthest away. Our people told them it would take another day before the Ozettes could even come. And of course, the treaty party wanted things done faster than that, but that's the reality of the times. Everyone had to come by canoe or boat. They 
it, the translation was a three-way translation. The people spoke English, the government people, and then there was a man who interpreted that into Chinook jargon, which is, is a limited trade language vocabulary that the most of the tribes here used as well as the traders, but it doesn't convey all of the legal implications of the treaty, of course, and but to the best of their ability, I think they tried to get across the, some of the points in the treaty. And I also think a lot was lost in translation. The main thing he would tell me, my dad would tell me, was that you don't look at the minutes of, you don't look at the treaty itself, you look at the minutes of the treaty. And if you can digest the minutes of the treaty, you'll know what all of the wording that's in the treaty means. So I've, I've, I've maintained that all my life, that if you're going to understand our treaty, you better get the minutes so you can understand what our forefathers went through to get that and the meanings that they were looking for as they were negotiating. In the minutes, we say that we want our original locations and our hunting and fishing places. and. We had villages on Wada Island and Tatoosh Island, and yet in the actual treaty itself, it says that we will cede our islands, but it was not made clear in the negotiations. And so we didn't get our islands back until 1980, 1980s. And so our reservation now is um, just about 38 square miles, um, but previously, of course, we had control of a much bigger area um, of land, even more importantly than our control of that land would be um, access to and control of the ocean resources. So um, during the treaty negotiations with the federal government prior to 1855, um, our people made it very clear that we needed to access um, the ocean to continue our way of life. So um, the treaty signers, the treaty negotiators made sure that we had um, access to our traditional fishing and hunting grounds on the water because of course sea mammals and fish and shellfish have always been really important to us and really still are. So we agreed to take a pretty small piece of land to live on but insisted on um, maintaining um, access to a pretty large body of water. The early treaties, they first wanted to push um, or send all the Indian people to eastern Washington, um, which is a totally different climate. You know, none of the, um, the rivers or the water and, and asking people to leave their ancestors and their villages. And, and people wouldn't go, didn't want to go. So. There was a treaty, the Chehalis River Treaty uh, in 1855. They asked people to go up north um, and they didn't specify an area, but it turned out to be near the, uh, the Quinault Indian Reservation. Multiple tribes were there and none of them would agree to the terms. Uh, uh, Governor Isaac Stevens, uh, you know, left the treaty grounds and they, everyone went home without a treaty signed. And that followed with the following year what was called the Treaty of Olympia, um, which was signed only with the Quinault and Quileute tribes and none of the uh, other lower river tribes, tribes down here signed that by uh, presidential proclamation that reservation was expanded from 10,000 acres to 220,000 and uh, the Chinooks and the Cowlitz and Chehalis and Shoalwater, many other tribes were then given land on the expanded reservation. Isaac I. Stevens came to Walla Walla country and uh, to meet with the uh, Umatillas, Walla Wallas, Cayuse, Yakamas, Palouse, and Nespers. All the tribes gathered there. 
It was, it was a great, great gathering at Darren Walla Walla, what the Nispers call Paskpa. Paskpa is a name for the Walla Walla country. And we, the Nispers came in force. The boy, it was said, it was marked through history there by Sohon, who was all with, uh, with uh, Azekiah Stevens. The Nespers came back and rode down the warriors, and they were singing their songs. And they came down, and they were war hooping and yelling around, and it, was, it must have been quite a sight to behold. But again, once they sat down and going through the translations, and they had to go through a bunch of translators, and I believe much of that was lost. One of the things about the Treaty Council that people don't know is that um, when Stevens was making that, he was only going to establish two reservations, the Yakima and the Nespers. But it was our leaders here on the Umatilla that fought and said, no, we don't want to be that far removed from our homeland. And so they fought and they negotiated for a third um, reservation, which became the Umatilla. The tribes here, Umatilla, Walla Walla, and Cayuse, signed a treaty in 1855 with the federal government. When we signed that treaty, we gave away 6.4 million acres, but we retained our right to gather, hunt, and fish. When the treaty signers signed that treaty, they had a foresight for future generations to continue with a way of life, which is dependent on those resources, dependent on a traditional way of life to continue to hunt, fish, gather roots and berries and medicines. I remember reading there where one of the, I believe he's a Cayuse, and uh, he got up and he said, everything was, not everybody's mind. He stood there before the council, he says, does the earth know what's happening to it? Does the earth even know that these lines are being drawn across it? Does the earth even, I mean, does, does it know it? Does it realize these things? Who's going to speak for the earth? Those words are very, very strong, not only for those, I mean, all those tribes here, but for everyone that's across this land here today. And we all are going to have to speak for the earth now. As far as what's happening to the exploitation that's taken place, it's enormous. And the, the forests are being destroyed. Our, our, our atmosphere is being changed. We all have to speak for the year. If we have to think back that time period, 1855, the wisdom of that man. The attitude is, with treaties, is that, you know, the federal government gave the Nez Perce tribe in the Treaty of 185, and they didn't give us anything. They didn't give us anything they took. They took from us a lot. And what we did as a people, as we reserved through those treaties, some rights, you know, hunting and fishing and gathering. We reserved those rights. And, um, you know, I just can never say it enough. I am so thankful for the wisdom of our elders in, in negotiating our treaties, because I know there are other tribes that aren't as fortunate as us. We signed a treaty here uh, in the Dalles, and we gave up a lot of our land and a lot of our fishing rights. And we were pretty much forced, we didn't have a say, but we were pretty much forced to move to the Warm Springs Reservation. And we, the, our ancestors started moving in the late 1880s. And during that move, I think a lot happened to, to the ancestors when they moved. First of all, it was physically a real shock. Um, you just have to imagine what it'd be like for you to be forcefully moved out of your house and your community and to an area that you didn't know very well. And we were known for our trade, for our salmon fishing. The food was always with us. We were moved south to a semi-arid area, totally isolated. You know, there were no people to trade with. And I think the, what happened was the ancestors were 
focusing on just surviving. The band that lives in this area and that signed the treaty here uh, at Council Grove is the Ksanka band, which was the band that lived in the area that's referred to today as Montana. And as the Europeans began to move in and the ways of life changed and the buffalo were wiped out, the people, as happened with all tribes, became less dependent upon the natural resources to, to live and more dependent upon the trade goods. And with that came poverty when those things weren't available. And it progressively got worse and worse and it became more and more difficult for people just to stay alive. And by the time 1855 rolled around, when Governor Stevens right here on this ground wanted to meet with the different tribes to sign treaties with them, the Kootenays were in a pretty bad way. They were hungry and starving, and I mean, it, it, it was hard times. And so, when the chief came down to meet with Governor Stevens, one of the things that he had in mind was to stop the wars, stop the killing, and for the Aksmaknik to still be able to go throughout the places they've always gone and to gather the foods and the medicines and, and everything that they've always done before. The tribal leaders at that time, you know, believed that language that said, this land is set aside for the exclusive use and benefit of these Indian peoples. And they believed that was forever. The idea of owning land, of owning the, of owning the land. If you can think about the, the worldview, the perspective that took place and how we as human beings, what, where our place is in all of creation and where us as an individual, what our place is in all of this. To have the, the gall or the audacity to assume that we could own all the rest of this. It's, one, it's some of our possessions. That was a foreign concept. It was just something that, that couldn't be grasped. But from the Western perspective, owning the land is everything. You know, they assume that, well, if this tribe is camping here now and they're camping in the fall, they're camping somewhere else, in the winter they're camping somewhere else, they must not own this land. So we can claim it and say it's ours. Well. That idea of property ownership was one of the largest misunderstandings among the two worldviews. And so when Governor Stevens told the Kootenays, you have to give up all of your aboriginal territory. Everywhere where you've gone before, you don't own that anymore. What you will own will reserve a smaller part of it up here and we'll call it the reservation and that will be that will be yours will that'll be preserved you'll own that part the idea was strange to the Kootenai chief and so what he said was okay you can say that you own all of this you can go ahead and say that if we can always go where we've always gone, always collect the foods we've always collected, always done the things we've always done everywhere we've, everywhere we've gone and done that in the past. You know, he was trying to figure out a way, okay, we can both meet our needs here. You can go ahead and say you own the land, but you know, this, this earth has been here for thousands and thousands of generations and you're, you know, in a few short years, you're not even going to exist, but you can say you, you know, the idea that you would own a piece of it is, you know, absurd. But if you want to say you own it, go ahead and say you own it. As long as we can do what we do. You do what you want to do, we do what we want to do. And as long as those things are in agreement and you stop killing us, then, then, you know, this can work. In the Hellgate Treaty, 
there is a provision for the survey of another reservation because Victor, who was the principal leader at that time, had no intention of moving from the Bitterroot Valley. You know, he recognized that this was the Ponderay, the upper Ponderay were occupying this area, and yes, we're relatives, and but that he had no intention of leaving the Bitterroot. And so the survey of the Bitterroot was supposed to be done. It was promised and guaranteed in, in the Hellgate Treaty, but it, it was never really, really done. And so Victor died, I believe, in 1872. And so then his son, um, who people are more familiar with and referred to as Chief Charlot, um, became the principal leader of the Bitterroot Salish. He stayed. He knew his father never intended um, to leave, and that was a solemn obligation. And, and when uh, James Garfield was sent out to convince him to move, he, you know, he had no intention and he was unwilling. And then Garfield produced a document in Washington, D.C. that supposedly had his mark on it as if he said, okay, I'll gather everybody together and we'll move now. And he was very bitter and to the day he died said he never agreed to leave. And they stayed in the Bitterroot until 1891. And I think poverty and um, pressure from the settlers uh, forced them. I guess they were doing very poorly. And that's a very sad, a very sad, I think he died probably of um, a broken heart, having to move and then having to see allotment, you know, and then I think he died the year they opened the reservation up to homesteading in 1910. You know, after seeding over 22 million acres um, and the reservation was allotted in 1904 and then unallotted lands were declared surplus and open to white homesteaders in 1910, we lost over 60% of this small sanctuary of land base and have been buying it back at a premium um, for decades. And so we have now recovered over 300,000 acres of land that was lost. That's a remarkable story. They didn't want to be uh, told what to do, I guess. Some of the generals uh, wanted to put the cord lanes into the cobbles. And they know they didn't want, they didn't want, say, uh, why, why leave, uh, leave up here, go over there where we don't know. Said we couldn't make a living. Here we know what, how to make a living because we have our lakes, our mountains, we have everything here, we, we know how to live here. Up through the 50s, more and more people started drifting in here and drifting in here. And the army met with the Coeur d'Alene's and promised that they would help the Coeur d'Alene's and keep these people out of their lands. The treaty that was made with the Yakimas and the Umatilla and the Cayuse and the Walla Walla and then part of the Nespers was made in 55. Right after that, there was a treaty supposed to be made with the Coeur d'Alene's to name the areas that we did not want white people to come into. Little did we know that even at that time when they were promising to help keep the settlers out of our area, they were already appropriating in Congress money to build a road right through the middle of our country and to open up this country with this military road they called the Mullen Road.
the buffalo, when, when it came extinct, that was within, what, three years? They were just, they went from thousands and thousands and big, huge herds to none, to absolutely none. And how disheartening it must have been for the Indian people to go out onto the plains and see rotting carcasses. I mean, they didn't even take the meat. You know, they they take the the skins or or even just shoot them for for sport and leave them there to rot. So it must have been very hard culturally, uh, and that was what the men did at that time. They were hunters. They were the hunters, and when you don't have anything to hunt anymore, that's like being fired from your job. In 1855, the, the land that was set aside to our people was, a lot of things happened to that piece of ground. It's really a sad story as far as you look at our land base today. The land, uh, when they came by, they told us that no white man would be allowed to come on our reservation without our, our endorsement or authorization or, or our blessing. In 1860, they discovered gold discover gold on our reservation and white people go crazy over gold. Next thing you know, they had gold miners coming in every which way to our reservation, but they didn't leave. They start homesteading around the area, start squatting on the land. And the government found themselves in a position now, well, what are we going to do? We have all these Anglo people all over the Nisperus reservation, which we told them we wasn't going to allow. And all of a sudden, well, what are we going to do? Well, make another treaty. In 1863, another treaty was made and uh, divided the land even, even smaller and also divided many of the Nisperus people. Divided us completely. Because some of them, the, they would not sign it. And uh, some of the leaders did sign it. The ones that signed this piece of treaty was ones that uh, were within those boundaries. And in fact, it's pretty much the present day boundary what we have today. And uh, they were Christian uh, leaders. The ones who were outside the reservation did not sign it. People like uh, Joseph, Looking Glass, White Bird, Tuhlutsut, and many others that were outside the boundary area. And they wouldn't sign it. And then, as far as they were concerned, as far as tribal government, if, they'd, if they didn't agree with it, they didn't have to abide by it. And uh, the, the soldiers, or the treaty commissioners, says the majority of the Nisperus signed it, so therefore you all have to abide by it. It's a different form of law as far as the Nisperus were concerned. Thus, did the War of 1877. At the Battle of Bear Paw, uh, when Himatoit Lakat, uh, Chief Joseph, surrendered, the people were taken to Indian Territory in Oklahoma. And it was a real bad experience. And that's where my grandpa was born. Grandpa, he wouldn't, he wouldn't talk about it. He would not. Being a descendant of um, what everybody calls uh, the Chief Joseph Band, even though it was several bands that uh, were in the flight of 1877, my, I have uh, great grandfathers who were um, in that flight and, and a part of that. During the flight, there was a lot of death. And I can remember uh, Mother talking about the elders and how distressing it was that they had to bury our people in such shallow graves to, to, to keep going. And now to, to listen to the elders talk about how sacred that land is, all of that land along that whole flight is sacred because everywhere there, there's bodies of our, our people. And when I think about um, the reasons why our people fought for the land and the, the flight of 1877, why they didn't want to give up the Wa'awa Valley, why they didn't want to get up, give up you know, the Salmon River area, um, all of those places that were so important to our people. You know, the, there is one thing that's written in books, but my mother said is, is really true that um, Joseph's father, old Joseph, um, told him you know, not to ever sell the bones of your, your mother and your father. And, and by 1871, when old Joseph dies, we're already fractionalized and split amongst our relatives and our friends by Christianity, by treaties, by government intervention, by alcohol, by trappers and traders. 
The division and, and fractionalization has already become part of a way of life. And by 1877, when they go into exile, it is a mere distance in time from when the expedition came through. And for us, it's only a couple generations ago that that exile began. It's also important to, uh, that the story is told about what happened to the land, uh, how people uh, in my father's generation, my grandmother's generation, uh, were taken and sent to Indian schools, and uh, you know the government policy was clearly stated. Uh, you know, kill the Indian, save the child, and uh, it was really tough times for people to uh, to live through and to try to maintain their culture and try to maintain their family connections. Our heritage is from a very, very strong people. I'm, I'm very grateful to still be here as a human being after all our people were really put through and uh, I have a deep uh, feeling of gratitude for the strength of our people to be able to withstand what they had to withstand. We are unique people. We have a story and we have a tradition and uh, I think this to me is the most important thing. To know who we are and know our history. Know that uh, we've existed here from time immemorial and that we we are going to maintain, we are going to survive. And we've survived a lot. You know, the terminations, the treaty days, the reservation days, we've survived them. We're still here. And the perseverance that our elders, our leaders have had, the foresight they had, it's why we're here today. So I have to admire what, you know, what our forefathers left us. And they left us a lot, you know, and we look at our treaty and the things they left in our treaty, and you have to marvel at. And seeing that the old ways of protecting the resources and living closely with, on the water and on the land, seeing the importance of that uh, is, why we work so hard today to maintain the tribe. Um, our culture is the whole universe and we need to, to build it and, and maintain it. A lot of our things are disappearing today, but um, we still have um, a strong belief that, you know, as long as we take care of the land, as long as we practice the treaty, have that treaty piece of paper in our hand, you know, that's our legal documentation. And that gives us the right to use customed areas and something that our elders instilled in us. And it's up to us today to practice that and also tell our younger people, our children, our grandchildren, this is what, how we're going to survive. And our covenant with the Creator for giving us this place to live and for the animals and the plants here agreeing to sustain us if we would protect them transcends all of those modern jurisdictions. Clean air, clean water, clean land, a good place to live. Those things are things we should all mutually embrace. Ha-yi-yah, 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 ha-yi-yah,
Ha-ya, 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 ha-